Thing to Dreaming, and also the managing director of that very same company. Those of you who may be familiar with his name might remember him uh, as the Singapore Armed Forces Chief of the Artillery. He did retire in 2016 to move on to become a certified coach, training facilitator, uh, among other things, and a CrossFit trainer too. Lawrence, great to have you in the studio. Welcome to Money FM. Good morning, gentlemen. Yeah, and you've been doing a lot of different things. You are a Renaissance man reinventing a life. What? Tell us about uh, your time after the military and, and what you've been working on, because it's a lot of things. Oh, I wanted to explore the private sector mm -hmm. and to do things I never did uh, after the military. Yeah. So the first thing I did was to pick up music. Seriously, I've been playing saxophone for about 15 years. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I, I went into it seriously yeah. and always wanted to learn the drums. Uh, <laughs> so I pick up drums and I pick up the bass guitar. Yeah. Wow. So I've been doing that for the last five years. Wow. It's been amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you've been doing that. You've been doing coaching. Uh, you have a pub. I have a pub. I run yeah. a few companies. Entrepreneur. I have a vending machine business in Vietnam. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Is that all? Is that all? What it keeps me alive. I, I, I like I like interacting with people. Yeah, learning from them. I I think uh, that 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 uh, keeps me on my toes yeah. to find out what's happening around the world, what people are thinking, and what excites them. Yeah. Well, you've put it all together in this book, from doing to dreaming, the four practices of leadership. Of course, you started off in the military, as you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Let's go step by step. Talk about the military first. What leadership lessons did you learn there? Oh, it's a bit of uh, when when I retired, I have this nagging feeling that that uh, has been ironic. It's like I've learned so many things about leadership, uh, but nobody taught told me from day one what the journey would be like. Hmm. So I thought that uh, I better write this down so that I can inform those guys who are coming after me. If they knew what the journey would be like, then they can take active steps uh, to prepare themselves Yeah. so that they don't learn the mistakes that, uh, they, don't, they can learn from the mistakes that I did. What's the biggest lesson, Lawrence, that, that comes to mind right now I, that, that you learned during those days that would apply to people outside the military even? I think a lot of us as leaders, we think that uh, knowing what we do, being competent in what we do is good enough. Mm. And uh, that, that I don't think is good enough mm. at all. It's necessary. It's, but a good, it's a good start, right? It's a good start, <laughs> but it's not sufficient to be a leader because uh, there's this part about leadership that's doing things. Mm. There's also the other part about leadership that's uh, motivating people, inspiring people to accomplish things. Mm. So I think the latter is uh, more difficult. And, if you want to be a leader, you have to get into this serious business about uh, people. Hmm. And this is a part that uh, not many leaders are, are good at. Yeah, That's yeah. really refreshing to hear because, as you know, anecdotally, the average man on the street will say, ah, oh, in Singapore, they leave the military and then they get a nice job on this <laughs> board or that board. And are the leadership skills from the military transferable to companies, corporate worlds, whatever? What would you say to that? I think, I think the concepts are, are transferable, but how they do it uh, is mm. dependent on the context. Mm -hmm. So in the military, people are more docile, they have, uh, the values are more aligned, it's a culture, so things get done, and uh, things get done pretty fast. But in the private sector, it's a bit different. You, the people aspect uh, becomes more pronounced, and uh, this is a part where uh, we have to be more careful that uh, because we are so accustomed uh, to what happens in the military for 20 over years, and then presto, you are in the private sector and you think that yeah. outside is the same as yeah. <laughs> inside. Yeah. Inside, yeah. That's not, it's not the same. The people are completely different. The culture is completely different. Hmm. And that's, that is where you need to adapt and you need to contextualize how you lead people uh, differently. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're talking to Lawrence Lim, the author of From Doing to Dreaming, uh, spent a life in the Singapore Armed Forces and now in more recent years since 2016, and his retirement from that is uh, working in the private sector. Lawrence, I'd, I'd like to just ask one more question about that, because Singapore is a conservative society, and it would be argued, I think, you know, effectively that within a conservative society, the military would be the most conservative part of a conservative society in terms of 
having processes and, and, and you know, a, a real um, uh, specific way of going about things. And when you think about the, the world we're in today, the VUCA world, right, the volatile world we're in, how do we take those lessons of stability and structure and yet still be able to pivot like we had to do during the pandemic uh, or innovation, which is a, a huge topic and buzzword uh, in Singapore for many years now? How do we take conservative qualities and expand them into the real life world? Hmm. I, I think in the Singapore Armed Forces, uh, the, at least experience that I had, uh, we are always constantly challenged to do new things. And I think this is uh, the part of me that I'm very grateful for, hmm. that I was always given new challenges, new things to do, and uh, we are all, always innovating, uh, despite this uh, conventional thinking that, you no. Know, the military is very structured. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I'm wrong. I'm wrong in my... <laughs> no, it's okay. But yeah. I, so I, I might I, be I, off base I, or wrong in my assumption. Yeah, I think I think in the war fighting part, hmm. in how we do things, uh, is very structured. But yeah. in terms of how we think about the future, okay. how we can improve, I think many people will be very surprised that actually okay. it's, it's a very innovative organization. Hmm. Yeah. Which is why if you read in many military journals, they will, they will put the Singapore Armed Forces... As one of the most modern, advanced, hmm. innovative. In, in what way? I'm, I'm genuinely curious to hear about this. In what way are, are, is the military innovative? In, in the way it adapts NS or the way it comes up with military strategies and concepts? What is it that's so innovative? I, I, I think the part about uh, using, employing people is hmm. very innovative as, uh, in the Singapore Armed Forces. Uh, I think you appreciate that Singapore, we have a very tight labor market. Yeah. And for many years, you know, uh, the Singapore Morphers have not grown beyond a certain size. In yep. fact, it's shrinking, but yet we can still do uh, the operations, uh, the contingencies in a recent COVID contingency. And uh, you can't help but wonder how can we sustain all these operations uh, with very limited manpower. Hmm. And if you look at the type of systems that they have, I mean, I'm from the artillery, uh, from eight men, Operating a gun now is down to three men, operating a, a, the platform called a HIMARS. Hmm. Now that's innovation, hmm. using <laughs> delivering more firepower but with less people. Yeah, wow. from hmm. eight to three. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we weren't meaning to make this <laughs> talk about the SAF. No, but I'm but, very interested. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested. <laughs> I mean, but but the lessons that you're learning there, I think, are are the ones that you've put into this book and put into your into your coaching right exactly yeah. which is which is why i find the in the crossover so yeah. fascinating right and if i cannot yeah. and you can refuse to answer this question because <laughs> it's just come to me you talked about innovation you talk about declining manpower in the military you may know where i'm going with this i have a 14 year old daughter i actually believe she should do ns if it was possible what do you think i'm i mean it's always good that uh, we we encourage people who have the the uh Willingness to serve, to, to serve Singapore because they live on this island. Mm. So I think I think the Singapore officers will be very grateful mm. uh, if people who live on this island see the need to want to contribute to the society at large. Mm. So yeah. I think it's something to be encouraged. Mm. And uh, well, I should say to your daughter pursue her dreams. <laughs> okay, you didn't, just do it. It. <laughs> you didn't quite answer it, but I understand it why. It was a good answer, it though, was wasn't it? was a very, very good answer. Uh, very, Lawrence, very good let's, answer. let's move back to, uh, to your company, From Doing to Dreaming, and the book, From Doing to Dreaming, Four Practices of Leadership. Uh, give us an overview. What are the four practices that you talk about in this book? Right, uh, the four practices are really about competency mm. as a foundation, uh, and then moving on to uh, building teams, which is... Uh, uh, the people about the, the the component about people, how to lead teams, before moving out, uh, moving on to playing a role in an organization, hmm. which is uh, what I call the acting part, acting your role, and uh, before culminating in the final step, which is uh, being an inspiration to people. So I use the four Chinese uh, character, Shi Ren, Xi Meng. Uh, to depict uh, these four practices. Mm, mm. And let's talk first about competency. Right. What does that mean in, in the structure that you've defined? Right. Uh, competency is a foundation of every leader. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, then you don't have the authority to lead at all. 
Mm. So I think for leaders, uh, you need to understand that uh, you must walk the talk. You must be good at what you're doing before you can move to the next step, which is to grow teams. And uh, this is a part where you need to lead people to harness uh, the collective capabilities of your team. Mm. And, and from my observation, not many leaders uh, understand this, that they need to grow teams. They use teams, but they don't understand how to grow teams. And there's a distinct difference between using people and harnessing their collective capabilities. Uh, so how do you get from one to the other? Oh, there's a lot of uh, practice. How, how, there are tools that you can use, right? Uh, team building tools, how you communicate with team members, how you handle conflicts, how you negotiate uh, between uh, different uh, positions. A lot of people say diversity is good, right? But if you can't harness the goodness of the diversity, uh, diversity can be divisive. And this is a part that a lot of leaders don't understand. They don't deploy tools or they don't understand uh, how what it takes uh, to really people together in a team uh, towards a collective uh, objective. Mm. Mm. And and Singapore has often had a very hierarchical system, right? right. Starts in the education uh, system and, and carries on. Are Singapore companies realizing this? You know, are, are the, the C-suite uh, or the MD level, are they understanding now that they have to work with, they have to a- approach their competency in a different way and they have to approach teams in a different way? Yeah. Is that message coming through? I think it's improving. Uh, I mean, back 20 years ago, a lot of corporations, organizations, they think that they just send their people on causes. Yeah, top down. And then, boom, voila. You know, right. they come back, they'll perform. But it doesn't happen quite like that because uh, competency must be grown in the context of the organization. Meaning, if somebody goes for training, he then comes back, he needs to perform in the context of the work. Mm-hmm. And this is where the leader comes in. He needs to help the employee or the person uh, perform uh, after acquiring new skills, new knowledge then the leader needs to help an employee perform in that role and needs to contextualize the learning experience into the applicative uh, in the current job. Yeah. So this is a part where, again, uh, many leaders don't understand. They think that they can outsource competency. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but, but it can't be outsourced. Yeah. yeah. It's very yeah. refreshing because you seem to be looking at it the other way around to how I often hear it, which is employer says you do. Yeah. And if you don't do it, it's somehow your fault, but you're seeing it the other way around. The, the impetus or the onus is on the employer to make sure that the communication is correct, the instructions are correct, and it's a shared relationship. Would that be fair? Yes, and, and that's the difference between a great organization from, from an ordinary one, right? Because they really care deeply about their people and they're genuine about it. And this is how it manifests itself. They're interested in the development of the people. They take mm. active steps to do it. Every leader across the echelon understand this. Mm. And this is how I think employees feel engaged, mm. that uh, somebody's interested in my development, interested in me, mm. not just as a, as a digit, but as a person. Mm. <laughs> Will this help Singapore companies slow the, the brain drain? Because as you know, you know, right around this time of year after the bonuses come in, everybody leaves, everybody goes to a new company, everybody looks for a raise or whatever. You know, Having this mindset that you're talking about, could this potentially... Uh, encourage more employees to stay put longer, uh, never mind what we just saw through COVID, uh, the quiet quitting and, and people leaving because of things. I, is this a key element to be, being an employer of choice? I, I think so, because uh, when people feel that uh, they belong, they stay, mm. and uh, if they understand where they're going, uh, they work with great people, they work with great teams, and uh, they are not there to play politics, but they are there to contribute to a mission, of uh, organization that they love, I think they become energized. Mm. And this is where I think if you read many management books, they talk about uh, culture. Mm. And I think this is the positive culture mm. that that will eventually manifest. And uh, people want to stay long in, in such a great organization. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So how, how do you say you do it across? Because you're involved in so many things. You've got your fingers in so <laughs> many pies. What is it about your particular leadership style that hopefully inspires whether it's the person working in your pub or the person working, was it Vietnam, did you say? Vietnam, yes. Vietnam, yes. 
what is it about you that, that is, you're transmitting to these to these staff members? I'm I'm a very people kind of person. Yeah, so I think uh, I listen a lot. So people people open up to me and uh, they tell me about the problems. Uh, I I think for me, I think that's a basic uh, foundation to know all your employees as a person, and you can relate to them as a person. Mm. Then work becomes easy mm. because you have the relationship. Yeah, so my approach has been always been to work on the relational aspect first. Yeah, so I think that's my uh, my strength, mm. my claim to fame. So I know all my employees uh, pretty well, mm. uh, down to the families, and and when they talk to me or when I demand certain things, they know where I'm co- where I'm coming from, mm. and uh, they know. There's no question about your uh, where your your vision is, right, or your mission is. If yes. I can use a military term. <laughs> <laughs> they, they know where I'm coming from in, yeah. in the sense that they know I won't do make them do frivolous things right because they know me as a person mm. right and I and and I think they know that uh, when I make certain decisions is for the good of everyone mm-hmm. so so we spend less time arguing because uh, I think behind their minds uh, they know what I stand for and that's mm. very important right mm. yeah. in, in times of criticality or, or you know, you're no time or under pressure People just do it. No, they do it first because they have this quiet confidence and understanding of uh, where you're leading them. Mm. Yeah. But that's more, listening to you now, that's more EQ than IQ. You seem to be a very gregarious character, which is fantastic, <laughs> which is what you want. But you don't often see that. How do we transfer that IQ into more EQ? Is it even possible? Oh, it's possible. It takes a lot of practice. You know, I, I you know a lot of people say I'm an extrovert, but... I will think that I'm an introvert. Really? <laughs> Is that right? I, I was very mm. afraid of public speaking mm. you know, when I was young. But uh, I, I uh, deliberately challenged myself. I took classes, I consulted people, and uh, I worked on it. So it's something that you can work on, but uh, uh, you've got to be brave about it. And a lot of people think IQ is everything. It's not everything. You know, I, I grew up with very smart people. Smart people in my class, uh, but but uh, I think three quarters of them don't become leaders. Mm. They're very smart, but they're smart in their own domain, but uh, they're not effective in inspiring people or yeah. making people work together. So this is the the mojo, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the mojo, hundred percent, man. Lawrence, we we do have to leave it there, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, do take a look at this book from doing to dreaming, the four practices of leadership. The author is Lawrence Lim, also the MD of from doing to dreaming, and it is from doing to dreaming dot com. If they want to get in touch with you, is that the best way for people to reach out? Yes, to you? sir. And I've put the link in our Facebook live chat right. as long as, as well as details of the book. Right. Lawrence, thanks so much for being with us today. Fascinating discussion. Thank you, gentlemen.